This is a presentation of the Center for Advanced Study at the University of Illinois. For over 50 years, the Center for Advanced Study has brought together scholars from diverse disciplines and backgrounds, encouraging and rewarding excellence in all areas of academic inquiry at Illinois, one of the nation's premier public universities. For more information about this presentation and other center activities, please visit cas.illinois.edu. My name is Leon Dash. I'm a CAS professor of journalism uh, and the newly appointed director of the Center for Advanced Study. Um, interim Provost uh, Easter, I am delighted that you were able to take time out of your busy schedule to join us tonight. I am more than humbled by the accomplishments of CAS faculty, both past and present. It is my distinct pleasure to welcome you all to tonight's annual lecture one of the Center's most important annual events. For the past 19 years, the Center has showcased the work of ACAS professor in this annual lecture, Michael Moore, CAS professor of philosophy and law, will deliver tonight's talk, Mechanical Brains and Responsible Choices. Appointment to a CAS professorship is considered to be one of the highest honors that the university can bestow upon a faculty member at the Urbana-Champaign campus. Michael was appointed to the center in 2005, and he's one of 27 current CAS professors. I want to delay Michael's talk briefly to give you a little information about the Center for Advanced Study. Of particular importance to the faculty on our campus is this center of for Advanced Study Associates and Fellows Program, granting one semester of release time away from the classroom, classroom to devote to research. I, along with all of the other center professors, meet annually to review all of the applications from departments across campus and select the most outstanding proposals. On behalf of the CAS professors, let me take this moment to acknowledge the tremendous support extended by the Office of the Provost. Thanks to the provost's increased funding for this vital program, we were able to appoint 28 associates and fellows this year. You will find summaries of these winning projects on our website. Perhaps I should mention that the deadline for applications for release time in the next acad academic year is in a few weeks on October 20th. CAS CAS coordinates or participates in many of the interdisciplinary intellectual activities on campus, including the CAS annual initiative, information about this year's in initiative, interpreting techno science, explorations in identity, culture, and democracy can be found on our website. And you may already have seen several posters about upcoming events. We also produced the prestigious CAS Millicom series of public events, as well as talks highlighting the current research of our faculty across the campus. Finally, I would like to thank my staff at the Center for Advanced Study, Masumi Iriye, Liesel Wilhagen, Cheryl Reeder, and Joyce Gladney. Before I forget, there is a reception immediately following the lecture just outside in the auditorium. It is my pleasure now to introduce Professor Bruce Cummings, Chair of the Department of Philosophy. Thank you. It is my immense privilege and pleasure to represent the philosophy department at UIUC in introducing CAS professor and Walgreen professor Michael Moore. Professor Moore's influence at the interface of law and philosophy extends well beyond his amazing publication record, which you'll hear about shortly. Until recently, he was co-head of the Intentions and Brain States Research Group, a subgroup of the MacArthur Foundation Law and Neuroscience Group. He's now transferred to the Research Network on Responsibility, Addiction, and Diminished Brains, which he co-chairs with Stephen Morse. Professors Moore and Hurd founded the annual conclave of the Institutes of Law and Philosophy, involving members of the institutes at Rutgers, Penn, and San Diego. He's the motivating force behind the regular roundtables of the UIUC program in Law and Philosophy, 
and an active participant in the San Diego Law and Philosophy Roundtables. He was also involved in the joint venture on philosophy, economics, and corporate law between the Law and Philosophy and Law and Economics Institutes at Penn, UC Berkeley, and Illinois. He's taken law and philosophy all over the globe, to Israel, to Russia, to Argentina, to Germany, to Australia, just to mention a few. Michael Moore has been perhaps the most visible and able expositor and defender of the essential and central role of propositional attitude psychology in our understanding of morals and the law. In particular, he has documented and elucidated the pivotal role of intentions in the classification of wrongdoing and harm, and in the justification for holding persons responsible for their actions. In one way or another, this theme runs through all of his major works, tying it together philosophically. This issue matters to philosophy. Compatibilist philosophers, those who hold the majority position that responsibility is compatible with determinism, argue that we cannot be held responsible for uncaused actions, if indeed such a thing would even count as an action, but only for actions caused by our intentions. If it turns out that our actions are not caused by our intentions, either because, as Paul Churchland argued many years ago, there are no propositional attitude states in our brain or because they occur too late to matter, then compatibilism fails as a defense against hard determinism. Let me show you a little picture here. Whoops. All right. <laughs> we can afford to ignore the blue line in the slide behind me the one that bypasses Professor Moore altogether. But as Stendhal asked in a different connection, are the red and the black compatible? The issue goes well beyond compatibilism, extending to the validity and accuracy of our ordinary way of thinking of ourselves and others in terms of belief, desire, and intention. The game of life, as we ordinarily understand it, goes something like this. Michael's desire to relieve his frustration and his belief that screaming will do the trick yield a plan to relieve his frustration, and this in turn leads to the intention to scream. Whoops. <laughs> this alters the environment, in this case the emotional environment of his thoughts, which in turn alters his beliefs and desires. So this is a familiar way of understanding ourselves and others. But this familiar scheme is not without its problems. Not to put too fine a point on it, the cognitive sciences are finding it increasingly difficult to fit their findings into a framework of propositional attitudes. A framework seemingly not well suited for understanding learning, its relationship to growth and development, to gene expression in the brain, to the evolution of the brain's functions. Years ago, I called law and ethics, along with epistemology, consumers of the products of the cognitive sciences. They are finding those products increasingly difficult to digest. Professor Moore has been focused on this interface for most of his career. No one is better situated to tell us what is at stake and how we might negotiate what now looks to some of us like the challenge the church faced in assimilating Galileo and Darwin. I'd like to yield the podium now to the Dean of Law, Professor Bruce Smith. Thanks very much, Rob. Uh, it is my great privilege as Dean of the College of Law to introduce my colleague, Michael Moore, Charles R. Walgreen, Jr., University Chair, Professor of Law, Professor of Philosophy, professor in the Center for Advanced Study, and co-director of the program in Law and Philosophy. Professor Cummins has already commented on Michael's widely recognized stature as one of the world's leading legal theorists. Numerous external indicia confirm this scholarly preeminence. Michael has had fellowships or faculty positions at the world's most prestigious research institutes and universities, including the Australian National University, Tel Aviv University, 
Erlangen and Nuremberg Universität in Germany, Lvov University in the Ukraine, Stanford, Northwestern, and many others. But rather than listing Michael's many, many accomplishments, I'd like to focus briefly on three aspects of his scholarship that are particularly impressive. Its breadth, its rigor, and its engagement with real world problems. Consider first the many topics that Professor Moore has engaged in over the years. The nature of interpretation, the justification of punishment, the nature of moral responsibility, the nature of liberty, and most recently, the nature of intentions in neuroscience. And even within these individual subject areas, he has shown immense breadth, ranging from the philosophy of mind, to the philosophy of action, to the philosophy of language, to psychiatry, to psychology, to economics. This interdisciplinary breadth is in the best tradition of the Center for Advanced Study. And while Michael's scholarship ranges very, very broadly, he is far from a scholarly gadfly. He engages systematically, rigorously, and with deep, deep research. His 1997 study, Placing Blame, a general theory of the criminal law, is widely regarded as the leading modern day uh, exposition of the retributist theory of punishment. His act in crime from 1993 provided a unified theory of action underlying Anglo-American criminal jurisprudence. And his most recent work, uh, 2009 Causation and Responsibility, explores and provides a systematic clarification of the philosophical foundations of the law of causation and its role in attributing responsibility. As many discussions in the College of Law's faculty lounge would suggest, Michael is adept at discussing classic thought experiments in law and philosophy. But his work is also deeply engaged with the real world and the practical problems that face us. Whether torture may be used justifiably in the war on terrorism, whether the death penalty has been imposed justly or might be, whether the legal prohibition on recreational drug use can be justified, and whether the destruction of the World Trade Center on 9-11 was one or two events for purposes of interpreting uh, the center's insurance policy, which limited recovery to 3.6 billion per occurrence. This suggests there is indeed money in philosophy. Uh, he has shown in his recent work no sign of divorcing his scholarship from the real world. One reviewer of his most recent work says, it is one of the most successful applications of analytical philosophy to substantive questions of law ever. To Michael's credit, he does not limit its voice to the sometimes rarefied world of legal philosophers and law professors. He has expressed his views in a range of venues, from the op-ed pages of the LA Times, to grand rounds in medical schools, to public debates, to the venues of Russian professors, to our grateful students who wait on his words and recognize that they are in the presence of greatness. As some of you know well, Michael is quite adept with a good story and a good quotation. I will leave you with one of the latter, which he knows himself quite well. The legal realist Carl Llewellyn noted in his book, The Common Law Tradition, that a good lawyer, quote, must have confidence in his craftsmanship, else he stands naked and hollow, helpless and worthless, a nothing, or a medicine man who has discovered his medicine to be a cheat. Good legal philosophers, like good lawyers, must have both confidence and craft. Knowing and respecting Michael as I do, I am sure that his lecture will demonstrate both. Michael. Well, damn, that was fun. I'm sorry to have to start to talk. Um, I'm very pleased to be here, very honored to give this lecture, particularly in light of people who preceded me on this podium, some of whom I see sitting in the audience. I was uh, giving some thought as to what I should lecture on. I, I took a page from Sue Kiefer's lecture of two years ago, where she decided she would give us a time slice of her career, not on everything that she had done, but just on one particular thing. And I thought I would do the same this evening. It would allow me to kill two birds with one stone, one I can imitate Sue. The other will answer the question that Bill Greenow some years ago said to me over lunch with a twinkle in his eyes. He looked at me and he said, we were classmates as undergraduates, 40 years on, he said, so just what do legal philosophers do? Well, if I give you a time slice of something that has interested me in the 40 odd years I've been teaching, maybe I can give you a, a partial answer. I'm very much indebted to Rob Cummins for his introduction. He saved me some of the things I needed to say. You should know he doesn't believe 
very much in that psychology he had on the board. Uh, I'm actually here to defend it, but nonetheless, to have it out up front is, is helpful. Maybe I can get a little more time on other um, topics. So the topic I want to talk to you about is something that was the topic of my first paper back in 1965 that I ever wrote, and is as recent as how I spent last weekend in Chicago with the MacArthur Foundation Neuroscience Project. The topic is the degree to which things we seem to deeply care about, the way we think about ourselves, the way we understand ourselves in terms of beliefs, desires, the way that we use that psychology to issue praise, to issue blame, the way that we build legal institutions on those moral notions, all seems to depend on a compatibility, as Rob rightly said, a compatibility with the most scientific psychology we can muster. The psychology we can muster has gotten better and better. We're long past the introspections of 1890. We're long past the dynamic psychiatry of Freud, the behaviorisms of Watson and Skinner, all of whom had their own skepticism about the psychology on which law and morality is based, as well as our own self-understanding. Um, we're long past all of that. We have a better science. But the challenges are the same, and that's the topic I want to talk about. It is a topic of momentous um, import. It has a great deal to do, first of all, with the design of legal institutions, which is one of the hats that I wear. You can't have a punishment system that is based, at least in part, on the idea that you deserve to be punished and it is a form of justice, retributive justice, to give you what you deserve. Very hard to have that kind of institutional design if you don't think there is such a thing as moral desert. The same is true in property. Very hard to have a property entitlement system based on the view that you deserve the fruits of your labor, as Locke said in 1660, or as modern Lockeans say about various property doctrines like copyright and so forth. Very hard to say that if you don't think there's such a thing as desert, that you deserve the praise that property rights give you, that you deserve the blame that criminal law punishment um, meets out. Both of those depend on a view of morality, both of those legal institutions. That says there is such a thing as praiseworthiness and blameworthiness, that you do have states by virtue of which we rightly praise you if you did well and rightly blame you if you didn't do so good. That does depend on exactly what Rob had up on the screen. I love my brain shooting someone up there. Um, that's what Rob himself calls the BDI psychology. Take it in steps. The psychology first presupposes that we act under representations of the world, what the scholastics of the Middle Ages called intentionality with a capital I. We represent the world in a certain way, and we act in accordance with those representations. Secondly, not just any representations will do. There are three sorts of representations that seem to guide us in rational action, the three that Rob had on the board. We have desires which represent the world as we want it to be. We have beliefs that represent the world as we believe it is. And we have intentions that represent the world as we intend to make it. Thirdly, those states for a rational actor need to be ordered in the way that Aristotle over 2,000 years ago charted as a practical syllogism. You wanted to know something about neuroscience and responsibility. You believed if you came tonight, you might learn something in that direction. Therefore, you formed the intention to come, and therefore, you came. Your coming is explained by the belief, desire, intention pattern of the form that Aristotle called practical rationality. That's so bedrock in our understanding, it's almost too obvious to state. We never state a full practical syllogism. A single premise will allow us to fill in uh, all the rest. So we have that kind of BDI psychology. We think, fourthly, that the behavior for which we could be praised or blamed is behavior that is caused by those representational states. There's a causal thesis, often called the autonomy thesis. There's a causal thesis. Those belief, desire, intention states do cause the behavior that are the objects of those states. There is also, fifthly, a sense that you need to have within those states something you can call free choice. That intention, in some sense, needs to be free for us to be responsible for having made the choices that we make. And lastly, sixthly, there needs to be an ownership principle. 
usually ever since Locke, tied to our consciousness, that in some sense those belief, desire, intention states are not what Freud called ego alien. They're not an it, an id. They're part of us. And we identify them as part of us by our consciousness of them in the first person. Put those six characteristics together and you have a thumbnail sketch of the kind of common sense, or what philosophers like to call folk psychology, on which the moral practices of praise and blame are built, and on which the legal practices of institutions that mete out punishments and rewards uh, are also built. So not exactly um, an insignificant part of our social life. If, as Rob was predicting, perhaps, we can't swallow the deliverances of an increasingly scientific psychology, then it looks like we lose those legal institutions, the morality on which they're based, and the common sense psychology in terms of which we understand ourselves. To quote one of my um, colleagues, Jerry Fodor in this context, he says, this would be a disaster. He says, if it isn't literally true that my wanting is causally responsible for my reaching, that my believing is causally responsible for my saying, then practically everything I believe about anything is false and it's the end of the world. Everybody likes to quote Jerry because he likes hyperbole. It really would be a disaster if somehow the psychology on which the law and morality is based could be unseated by a scientific psychology. Topic of my lecture is to reassure you it's really okay. Well, let's see how it goes as we wander along. What I'd like first to do is just give you, taking a page from Sue Kiefer, just a little bit of the history of this problem in terms of my own career. In 1965, I wrote a paper called The Wish to Bleed. It was a send-up in the twilight years during which psychoanalytic psychiatry dominated psychiatry. It was a send-up of the over-anthropomorphizing done by psychiatric theory of the Freudian psychoanalytic sort. I didn't think there really was a wish to bleed. It's a reductio ad absurdum. Namely, the paper defends the view that I could ascribe a wish to bleed as explaining why we bleed about as well as Freudians could explain why we dream by a wish to sleep. Part of the official theory of dreaming was we sleep in order to satisfy, we dream in order to satisfy our wish to sleep because otherwise the, the, dream, the dream diffuses what would otherwise wake us up. Um, I didn't see much evidence for a wish to sleep, so I was trying to de-animize that part of Freudian theory. That paper 10 years later led to a lecture on the psychoanalytic theory of dreams in the Pittsburgh series for the philosophy of science. Um, and I basically took apart the entire psychoanalytic theory of dreams piece by piece, trying to reconceptualize it away from its over-animizing of the phenomena and getting rid of things like wishes to sleep and dream sensors who have their own desires and the like, replacing them with what I called functional hypotheses, which are testable. There is no wish to sleep. What we want to see is whether or not dreaming tends to preserve sleep. Is there some homeostatic mechanism within us that makes us dream in order to allow us to keep asleep by diffusing otherwise awakening stimuli? That's a testable hypothesis. Looks like it's probably false. Quite different than the way Freud had put it. Just as an aside, my one chance to really become a Freudian, I passed up while I was writing this lecture at Pittsburgh. Um, it was a big deal. I was a young philosopher. Einstein had given this lecture years before. I was not going to let it go. But my father died about a month before I was to give the lecture. It wasn't anywhere near done. I had to get it done. So I just said, I will grieve later with respect to my father's death. I'm going to get the lecture done. The result was every night while I was writing a paper on Freudian dream theory, I produced one anxiety dream after another. During the month, I killed off my entire family and my dreams about two or three times over. <laughs> Particularly, I thought amusing, was the day that I wrote the paragraph in my lecture about Freud's notion that there were supervenient attitudes towards dreams. A supervenient attitude, as Freud describes it, psychologists call it differently these days is where you remember not just the content of the dream, but you remember the dreaming of that content and then the redreaming of it so as to satisfy certain desires. It's like you're putting on a little play for your own amusement while you're asleep. I wrote in that day, that there are hardly any supervenient dreams. That night, I produced a perfect textbook example <laughs> of a supervenient dream. 
Freud, in dealing with his patients, said he had the plastic impression of a second will operating contrary to your will. If I were ever going to become a Freudian, it would have been that moment. It sounded like a kind of joke. Now, I did that work with Freud way back in the 60s and 70s because Freud himself raised the kind of challenges I want to talk about tonight, but from a very different psychology. He said that the unconscious, in one of his metaphors or similes, the unconscious is the puppeteer of which our conscious will is merely the puppet. Or in another metaphor, the conscious will is like the man on horseback who has a great view of what's going on, but doesn't have any reins to control the horse. Or another way he put it in his introductory lectures, man had three great insults to his sense of himself. One was Copernicus, who told us the Earth is not the center of the universe. The second was Darwin, who said we're not that different than animals. And the third is a scientific psychology that says we're not even masters in our own house. That, he says, is the last blow to man's um, pretensions about his importance uh, in the world. Now flash forward. Last weekend, I met with my research group for the MacArthur Foundation. The MacArthur Foundation, I and a number of other philosophers, neuroscientists, cognitive psychologists, law professors, some years ago applied to the MacArthur Foundation for some substantial money to research these kinds of questions. Um, we asked for 70 million bucks. They gave us 10 million bucks, showing the truth of the old saying, if you ask for one whole heck of a lot, sometimes you get a lot. So anyway, we've been meeting for some years on the MacArthur Foundation's dollar to talk about these kinds of issues. So last weekend, we had a discussion about the very recent work, the last two years, of the articles by a researcher in Berlin named John Dylan Haynes. I was his commentator, and one of the things I learned as his commentator is the Germans hyphenate their names up front. It's John hyphen Dylan. It's not the English John Dylan hyphen uh, Haynes. Anyway, John Dylan. Research very striking. If you do fMRI, functional magnetic resonance imaging, in the precuneus area of the parietal cortex, rather than down in the supplementary motor area where it had been done before, which is what I'll talk about, you get the following striking result. In two, simple two-valued choices, in one experiment, the subjects are just to add or subtract. In another experiment, it's a choice between left and right index finger button pushing. For simple choices, where you give the subjects a fair amount of time, 25 seconds, to form their intention, and they can't execute it until the numbers appear, and then ask them to go ahead and execute it, he has a rather good reliability rating for telling the subjects what they intended seven to 10 seconds prior to them knowing what they intended. They report the onset of their awareness what they intended by watching a series of letters go by and when they form the intention as they see it, they remember the letter and that's how they time the formation at least of their experience of their own intention. John Dylan Haynes, seven to 10 seconds prior to that, I can tell you what you intend. The magazines have loved it. They picked him up as the new mind reader. Um, any event, we were having our discussion up in Chicago about this experimental result. And notice the way that John Dylan Haynes puts his research could have been Freud. Namely, he says, the brain decides 10 seconds before you do what it is you're going to do. The brain has already made its decision. What are you? You're just the rider on the horse that's way in the back, right? You're just sort of waiting to find out what the brain has decided without yourself having any causal efficacy to your decision is the picture. Well, that's as much a challenge as Freud ever was with, I think, much better data. What I want to do is explore that kind of challenge, and here's how I want to do it. Let me step back from the very recent experiments of John Dylan Haynes, go back to the early 80s when this series of experiments began of a whole series of scientists dealing with the issue of how we consciously will voluntary motor movement. State what they take their conclusions to be, subdivide them, philosophers never let people state their own conclusions, subdivide them in terms of my own taxonomy of what sorts of arguments they must be making, and having divided, I then hope to conquer. Namely, I'll take one argument at a time, with as long as you let me stand up here, um, and see if we can't uh, diffuse it a bit. So the experiments in question started in 1965 in Germany, where it was discovered that for voluntary motor movement, 
before fMRI, we were using EEGs, put electrodes on the outside of the vertex of the scalp right over the supplementary motor area, what was discovered was that about one second prior to the initiation of muscle activation, which we can measure precisely, um, about a second prior to muscle activation, there was a slow negative shift in electrical potential in the supplementary motor area that was consistent and detectable, called the readiness potential. So one second prior, there's a readiness potential prior to voluntary motor movement. And that sort of lay there for about 20 years. And a researcher who had spent his whole life doing consciousness studies, trying to make those respectable in psychology again, namely Benjamin Libet, who held a professorship at the University of California, San Francisco, decided to pair his consciousness research with this finding of the readiness potential. And in the famous experiments reported in 1983 and then in Brains and Behavior in a Symposium in 1985, Libet and his associates asked their subjects to time the awareness of when they were first aware of their intention or will to move their finger. He had a series of experiments, but the one that's gotten most of the attention is what he called a type two readiness potential. The subjects are not directed when to move. They're not, in fact, told to plan. They're told not to plan. They're supposed to have a spontaneous voluntary movement of their index finger or a flexing of the wrist. Um, in such subjects, the consistent finding was that Unlike for directed movements, the readiness potential peaks at about 550 milliseconds prior, it's about a half second, prior to the initiation of motor movement. The interesting feature was Libet tried then to measure when it was the subjects became consciously aware of the will to move their finger. And that came in, they, they did it not with the letters that John Dylan Haynes used, there was a clock that rotated about two, every two and a half seconds, and they would look at the position of the clock at the time they first experienced their decision to move. That came in at about 350 to 400 milliseconds after the readiness potential had already indicated the voluntary movement was going to take place. From which, Libet and those who replicated his experiment, which has been done many times, Patrick Haggard in London and many others, um, Daniel Wegner at Harvard's book, the illusion of conscious will tells you what he thinks. Um, use those experiments as well. The conclusion drawn is that the brain has already decided, as Libet said, to initiate the voluntary motor movement. And the conscious awareness of the will to move, the willing to move that's conscious, is really doing no work. It's too late. Causation doesn't work backwards. It can't cause the brain events. The brain events in the supplementary motor area cause the movement, and the consciousness is simply epiphenomenal, simply a dangler. It's perhaps caused by the same brain events, but it itself does no causing of the bodily movements in question. Well, that would be a very big deal if it turns out the belief, desires, and intentions that is the root of the common sense psychology on which law and morality is based, in fact, does not do the causal work that we think. It does. Now, Libet himself, shortly before he died, which was last year, summarized his experiments and those that followed him this way. He said, if the act now process, by which he meant voluntary motor movement, if the act now process is initiated unconsciously, then conscious free will is not doing it. I like that sentence from Libet because it runs a whole bunch of things together, which then I get to be employed as a philosopher to pull apart. Namely, I think there's a number of separate things going on. I've divided it in three. How you individuate arguments is always a bit arbitrary. You might think it's five. You might think it's two. I'll go with the three, and you can do your own organization. First, it looks like it's the fact that there are unconscious brain events that cause what we can think of as a choice to move that makes you skeptical about choices. Now, this is a form of determinism. Now, I'm going to give three variants of it. But the basic objection is that if a choice is caused, well, then it's not a free choice for which you can be responsible. Or it's not a choice at all, or something like that. Um, that's objection number one. Objection number two 
when you say conscious free will is not doing it, is not the objection that choices are caused by these unconscious cerebral events. It's rather that our choices do no causing. That is a separate objection. That it's caused is one objection. Maybe that makes you skeptical, maybe it doesn't. It's a very different objection to say, but it does no causing. That's quite a different objection. It's called the epiphenomenal objection. An epiphenomenon is simply a causal fork. Epiphenomenal events are co-effects of a common cause. Homely example. When I was younger, better shape, I used to run every morning with my dog. Two things would follow from my running. My feet would get tired, and my dog being in better shape, he would get tired after my feet would get tired. And it was as regular as day follows night that my feet would get tired and my dog would get tired. You might think that's a causal relationship, thus the illusion of conscious will, as Wegener calls it, but it isn't because it is simply, the regularity is simply due to there being co-effects of a common cause. Because I ran and caused two effects, it looked like my feet getting tired was a cause of my dog getting tired, but of course it isn't. They are simply co-effects, as I say, of a common cause. So the epiphenomenal objection. The conscious will is simply an effect of the brain events of the supplementary motor area measured by the readiness potential's slow negative shift. But the readiness potential, those events, whatever they are, are what cause the movements. The conscious willing doesn't do it. Now, the reason there's two objections here, they're both epiphenomenal, is one is that the willing doesn't do it, and the other is the consciousness of the willing doesn't do it. So I call the second argument the skepticism about the epiphenomenalism of the will. The third argument is skepticism about the epiphenomenalism of the consciousness of the will, which is actually different, located in a different area of the brain, probably quite different. So three sorts of objections. What I'd like to do is wander through them as quickly as possible and see if I can convince you, as I said, that everything's basically OK. Namely, our psychology is going to be fine. Um, OK, let me do the first one, that our choices are caused. My colleague, Eric Freifogel, is sitting up front. He came up to me last week and says, how can you talk about determinism, predestination, stuff you've been talking about 2,000 years in an hour? Well, here's the answer, Eric. I'm going to do it in about 10 minutes, because I really want to get on to the other objections, which means it's going to be very down and dirty. But let me just see if I can make plausible this compatibilist view, at least on its face. Now, I said I was going to have three different versions of this objection, that because choices are caused, they can't be the locus of responsibility. Let's do the three. The first one would be the view that choice itself, by its nature, must be uncaused, otherwise it wouldn't be a choice. Now, on its face, that's a damn peculiar claim. I was teaching free will determinism up at Northwestern years ago. My colleagues were sitting in. One of my colleagues was sitting there making this argument. And the beauty of Northwestern is sometimes you get the right building, you can look out at the lake. And I said, well, look, there's Lake Michigan. And I said, let me give you a causal explanation for the existence of the lake, given my knowledge of geology. That was very short. But I gave it, glaciation, so forth. And then I said, now look again. Is the lake still there or did it disappear? To explain is hardly ever to explain away. So to give a causal explanation usually doesn't make the thing disappear. It actually made the lake disappear for him because he was so insulted by my question. He got up and left, so his back was to the lake. So I guess it did disappear for him. But most phenomena, when you give causal accounts of, do not disappear. So the question has to be, but choice is different. Choice, intention, willing, decision, whatever you want to call it. It's different. To be a choice, it itself has to be uncaused. Now, how would you show that? Well, you could think it's an analytic truth. You could think it's like saying, to be a bachelor, you have to stay unmarried. Because the moment you get married, you're just not a bachelor. It's true by the meaning of the words. It doesn't seem to be true by the meaning of the word choice, that it's uncaused. It requires some sophisticated reflection. It doesn't seem as easy as an analytic truth, like a bachelor is an unmarried person. So try a second avenue. Maybe you could establish it by saying, it's an essential property of choices in a way it's not an essential property of lakes, that they not be caused by other factors that themselves are not chosen. That's an essential property, so without it, it can't be a choice. Well, think how plausible that is. Just one example. It's also a homely one. I was a young faculty member at another university. 
we had a very senior, our most senior and distinguished faculty member. Hope somebody doesn't do this to me someday. Um, he had done one thing in his life that he was really proud of. He had served in the Truman administration. So here was the game the young faculty would play at lunch. Make a subtle allusion to Truman and see if you could elicit from him one of the three boring stories that he told us again and again. <laughs> now, it's not a crime to bore your colleagues at lunch, although it probably should be. But nonetheless, it is a choice he made, is it not? To tell the story even though we caused it by saying something like, I drove through Independence, Missouri yesterday. Um, you would, as regular as clockwork, get one of the three boring stories for which I take it, there's a choice, although we caused it, just like in Otello, Otello's choice is caused by the information, misinformation he's given, thus he kills Desdemonia. Um, it's caused, but it's still a choice. It doesn't look like causation is incompatible with choice. So let me move to the second strand. I said this was going to be down and dirty. The second strand. The second strand goes like this. If choice is itself caused by brain events, then it itself must be a brain event. We need choices themselves, if they're in the causal path of brain events, whatever the readiness potential in the supplementary motor area measures, it must itself be a kind of brain event. Some people think from that identification of mental states like choices, decisions, and intentions with brain events, that therefore there are no choices, decisions, or intentions. I first ran into this version of the argument doing one of the things Bruce mentioned in his introduction. I and the old radical psychiatrist from Hungary, Tom Saws, were having opposing grand rounds presentations at the Kansas University Medical Center in the early 70s. Saws made his name with the book, The Myth of Mental Illness. One of the reasons he said mental illness is a myth is because of the hopes of 19th century psychiatry, which was to find a brain disease for every mental disease were realized. Well, then there wouldn't be any mental diseases. There would just be brain diseases. Um, that is a damn odd conclusion. In The Illusion of Conscious Will, Daniel Wegner, who's actually a friend of the argument, but not a friend of this bad aversion of it, gives this example. He says, suppose somebody says, you know what dancing is? I'm not going to tell the joke, you probably know. You know what dancing is? Dancing is two people moving together in rhythm, in time, to the music. It would be really peculiar, Wegner says, to then say, well, because dancing is just the motion of bodies through space and time with a certain musical coordination, that there is no dancing. No, you wouldn't. You would say, well, dancing has the following nature. It's the movement of bodies through space and time in a certain syncopation to the music. So you've got to do better than just say there's a nature to something, and therefore the thing that you're supposed to get the nature of doesn't exist. That's almost a contradiction. How about trying this? If the nature is really surprising, then the thing that you used to identify it with, say if you use conscious willing, and say all it is is complex patterns of two-valued switches going off in amazing complexity. That's a really surprising fact. There's nothing in the phenomenology we've had about conscious willing that would indicate it is simply that kind of two-valued switching going off uh, in a complex pattern. So maybe that's it. Maybe if that's the identification, you say, well, then really is there no choice? There's just no choice. Yeah, I don't think that's true either. Science tells us lots of wonderful and surprising things. Hilary Putnam, who was one of my first teachers in the philosophy of science, who visits here at Illinois every year at Tim MacArthur and um, um, his wife's house, ends up saying something like this just to drive home the point. Suppose he says pencils turned out to be spies for Mars. Now, what would you say? Would you say, therefore, there's no pencils? Or would you say, wow, pencils are really surprising, right? Those little devils, they're sitting there and they sit quietly because they desire not to be detected and believe that if they don't move, we won't know they're spies. And therefore, they have a very surprising nature. Putnam, you'll say the second, you'll say the second, because progress in science depends upon it. Less fanciful examples. So dreaming. Prior to 1950, dreaming's sole criterion was we had waking remembrances known not to have occurred. Then along came two psychologists, Demont and Kleitman, found out that there was REM behavior, rapid eye movements during sleep, correlated with the EEG patterns with regard to how the um, brain was performing. And we learned two interesting and surprising facts about dreaming. Now you've got two ways to go. 
You could do what Norman Malcolm, Malcolm did, a philosopher in his book on dreaming, 1959, saying, well, if that's what you mean, then there's no such thing as dreaming. Or you could say what everybody else said, well, dreaming has an interesting and surprising nature. It's just like finding out temperature is the mean kinetic energy of some molecules for a gas. It's surprising, that's not how it feels, but nonetheless, that's what it is. We have lots of surprising facts. The fact that it's surprising that conscious will should be realized in simply patterns of two-valued switches going off in the brain is interesting, but not a reason to deny that there's a conscious will. It just tells you what its nature might be. I've noticed when I get to this point in a lecture like this that there's still disbelief. So let me see if I can root it out. Here's the disbelief. It is, no, this is too damn surprising because of the absolutely unique and special nature of the idea of myself. I call this the point about the elusiveness of the I. The I refuses to be identified with anything else and remain an I, that is, remain me. Now Leibniz, the, Pol the German mathematician, told us if you want to test identity claims, see whether two putatively different things actually share all of their properties, it would be a test if they didn't, because if two putatively distinct things are really one thing, then they have to be indiscernible with respect to all of their properties. That's fancy, now try the homely ap application. Try this in your real life. You say to someone with whom you're intimate, I love you. Now someone comes along and says, well, the I is really just your body or part of your body. Try the substitution that Leibniz says tests identity. I've always found I get a different reaction. Instead of saying, I love you, I say, my body loves you. <laughs> or even if it's my brain loves you or my amygdala, where the emotions are love you, somehow it suggests I don't. It sort of comes across like I want to love you. I'm working at it. My brain loves you, and I'm, I'm trying, right? <laughs> So the I looks quite elusive. And yet, no matter how elusive, what else could it be? The alternatives are too unacceptable. If the I that we identify as ourselves, largely with consciousness, but in any case with the agency that our intentions measure, if that I just isn't those brain processes going off in different places in the brain, then you end up with this mysterious homunculi that you can't say anything about. Now, there are some philosophers, even ones with tenure, who argue this. <laughs> and they have a tenure at places like Oxford. Some of them put knots in front of my articles and call it their own article. But what most of us think is that is irredeemably mysterious. To say that there's one unique thing in the world about which you cannot say anything else, and that's human agency. It's mysterious and unique and can't be reduced to anything else can't do science if you put those kind of definitional stops in the way. Fred Skinner, the behaviorist, used to use that example, saying, and it doesn't help if you put a little guy inside the little guy in your brain. That's just an infinite regress of homunculi. National Film Board of Canada had a film like that they used to use in abnormal psych classes. There was a little guy inside the brain. When there was trouble, he had a little foxhole he dumped in and dropped the, the, the cover over. When it was safe, he'd come back out. But of course, Skinner's question always was, well, who's inside his head? Or if you don't like abnormal psychology texts, in the Woody Allen film, everything you wanted to know about sex, Woody's inside the body, he's down low, forget him. Burt Reynolds is up at the control panels, and he's running things, and you can see the incoming through the eyes, and he's running the levers. But of course, Skinner would say, but who's inside Burt's brain? Is there a little Burt? Homunculi that will be mysterious, will be mysterious no matter how many of them you put inside each person's brain. So the alternative to thinking, the self just is, certain brain patterns, uh, is just unacceptable. It's a definitional stop that, as I say, truncates science. Now I said there were three versions. The first version is a version that says choice is necessarily free, either analytically or metaphysically. The second version is a version that says mechanistic reductionism reduces away the phenomenon. Don't think that's true. Choice is choice, even if it turns out to be a certain pattern of goings on in the supplementary motor area or other motor areas behind that. Third version. There can be choice, but for responsibility, it has to be a free choice, meaning a choice that is not caused. This is truly free will. And Eric, this is about five minutes. So. 
Can there be free will? Huge topic. The view that Rob accurately in his introduction called compatibilism, that, to which I have been a lifelong adherent, does the following. If you look at a book like, say, a classic compatibilist text, Dan Dennett's Elbow Room, the bottom line conclusion is moral responsibility is fully compatible with the insight that our choices are caused by factors themselves unchosen, i.e., something caused us to choose it and we weren't in control of that something. But our responsibility is fully compatible with that. If you write a compatibilist book like Dennett's, Fisher, John Martin Fisher's, or others, then you do the following. You run through all of the criteria by which we ascribe responsibility and show that you can have every one of them, despite there being causation. You show that you can have action, agency, voluntariness of action, intention, will, decision, motives and reasons for action, freedom from compulsion. You can have all of that, even though behavior is fully caused. Now, one thing I'm not going to do tonight is recapitulate all of those arguments. But just pick one salient thing people think you need to be responsible. They think you need the capacity not to have done what you did, usually put as the capacity or the ability to do other than you, in fact, did. They think you have to have that to be responsible. I think you do, too. The question is what it means. Now, in the story that I gave you, I thought my colleague had the capacity not to tell the boring joke. He had the capacity not to tell if he just would decide not to tell, if he'd try not to tell. It's like saying to a runner, the coach says to the runner who doesn't win the race, you could have won it if you tried harder. He means you had the capacity to win it. You have the capacity to run a mile under four minutes. I don't. The good runner would have the capacity to run a mile under four minutes. If he doesn't, the coach can meaningfully say, even in a deterministic world, you could have won the race if you tried harder. My colleague could have refrained from boring us to death if he tried harder. I know that because I tested it. He had been assigned to teach legal writing, which is a sort of lecture sort of course, and was deeply insulted as a senior member of this faculty. So I thought, since that's also become he did a fixé for him. Let me put the two together. So I tried this sentence at lunch. Truman once taught legal writing. <laughs> I wanted to see which way the brain would go. And you know what he did? He refused both predicted responses. All of a sudden, he broke out of the boring Truman stories, broke out of his constant whining bitching about teaching legal writing, and said, really? He did? When did he do that? <laughs> So he was free, in any sense I care about, to have done otherwise. Now, did I cause his choice? Yes, but did he have the capacity not to tell the story? You bet. Contrast my causing his story to be told by my suggestion with the way in which, under hypnosis or with post-hypnotic suggestion, you cause people to do various sorts of behaviors. There, there's a suggestion that seems, although it's disputed, to eliminate or at least reduce responsibility. How come? Well, not because that suggestion is somehow more causative than my suggestion. It's rather because we think, in hypnosis, the ability to consciously respond to reasons is impaired. An article two years ago by Patrick Haggard in London studying responses to hypnotized or post-hypnotic suggestion. The responses, he says, feel involuntary, even though they use the same motor pathways, upper and lower, and the supplementary motor area as voluntary motor movement. But they seem to have a break higher up. They're non-responsive to reasons in a way ordinary suggestions are not. So I used to take my kids, my oldest kids, the youngest kids are here tonight. I meant to introduce them in the usual way parents embarrass them. I have Jillian and Aiden, my 12-year-old twins, here with their mother and my wife, Heidi Hurd. I'm delighted to have you. Anyway, my oldest kids, 27 years spread, really older kids, I used to take up to Sunset Strip when I was teaching at USC, which is where Pat the Hip Hypnotist was holding forth. And she would get people to do the damnedest, stupidest things, like raise their arm and cuckoo like a bird and so forth. Um, and if you'd ask why, as long as they weren't a lawyer, lawyers make crap up, but as long as they weren't a lawyer, <laughs> they would say, I don't know. That's the honest response so that they're cut off from having reasons for the behavior, even though it's very much like willed behavior 
all the way from the supplementary motor area down to the motor plates and the muscles. It uses the same machinery, but it looks cut off from responsiveness to reasons. Well, that's a real incapacity. My colleague didn't have that incapacity um, at all. Now, try this thought experiment. Um, James Q. Wilson did this one for us at MacArthur last year. He'd been work looking through the archives of neurology. Three years ago, this case was reported from the University of Virginia. A person had a right orbital frontal tumor, but that's to get ahead of the story. Go back a bit. This was a normal 40-year-old man, lived in Virginia, had not had any sort of sexual problems his entire life. All of a sudden, he reported an urge to watch pornography, and in particular, an urge to look at child pornography. Eventually, he started making improper advances to his stepdaughter and was prosecuted and convicted of basically a, a form of sexual assault in the Virginia courts. He went into the University of Virginia and it was discovered he had a tumor in the right orbital frontal area of the cortex, a large tumor, and he had it out. And after he had the tumor out, he reported that he had no more urges of this kind and thus that he was safe to return to the streets and so certified by the doctors. Two years later, the desire to look at child pornography and the urge to also make inappropriate advances to his stepdaughter. It wasn't just his stepdaughter. He sort of hit on everybody around. He was going in for surgery on the first tumor, and he was hitting on the nurses that were putting him under. So they finally put him over, took out the tumor, and they got rid of that. But anyway, he had the urges back again. Sure enough, the tumor had grown back again. They took it out again, and the urges went away. Question, do you think the Virginia courts got it wrong in light of what we now know to have blamed him for his choice to engage in inappropriate sexual contact with his stepdaughter in light of what we now know about the tumor. Wilson, the tumor is clearly a cause of the urges that he had, which without he, those urges, he wouldn't have done what he did. But so far, that doesn't differ from you and me. What we desire is a very under very limited control. At some point, even if you say what Aristotle said, which is you choose your character, well, you didn't choose the factors that caused you to choose your character then. At some point, you don't choose where your desires come from. But for responsibility, what you need is the capacity to act on those desires or not to act on those desires. That is, the capacity not to do the contact if he tried. If he has the capacity, he's responsible, even though we know in his case what is surely true in all of our cases, there are causes for what we desire, causes we ourselves did not choose, um, in which event he's fully responsible. Why do we have the intuition he might not be? Because right orbital frontal tumors do give rise to known incapacities. He had them, couldn't write, he couldn't do the designs that you're supposed to be able to do, and he had really poor impulse control so that you think that could be a true incapacity. Maybe he couldn't do better if he tried, if he's truly incapacitated. But notice what's doing the work for the compatibilists is the incapacity, which is not synonymous with it being caused. It being caused might be relevant only because what it causes is an incapacitation, but the causation itself is not the incapacitation, true compatibilism. Okay, well, those are the three versions of a skepticism that proceeds from the insight that our choices are caused. Now let me move to the epiphenomenal versions of the objections, and given the time, I'll consider both of them together. I'll consider both of them together because there's the same three answers to each of them. The two epiphenomenal objections, again, are the will does no causing of the bodily motions that are its putative object. And the second is, even if the will does some causing, consciousness of the will, the consciousness that makes it our will, does no causing. Since consciousness of the will, I don't think is the same as the will, I think those are two separate objections, but we can deal with them together in the interest of time. So I've got three arguments as to why that doesn't have the deleterious effect on responsibility, you might think. You know Freud's definition of a lawyer? Freud said, the lawyer's the guy who borrows your garden tools, brings them back in crappy shape, and doesn't say anything about it. You ask him what gives, bring back your garden tools, he doesn't say one thing, he says three. I never borrowed them, 
They were broken when I got them, and I returned them in perfect condition yesterday. <laughs> I'm a lawyer. I got three arguments. Argument number one, there's no evidence that just because conscious choice succeeds in time by 400 milliseconds in the supplementary motor area or even by 10 seconds in the parietal cortex, just because it succeeds in time, unconscious initiating brain processes, that's no argument that conscious will doesn't stand in the causal chain rather than in the dangler position outside the causal chain. Uh, in a recent book, Al Neely, who teaches philosophy of mind at Florida State gives this example. <clears throat> His book just came out this year. It's, um, it's called Effective Intentions, colon, The Power of the Conscious Will, to directly answer the, the vagrant book. Anyway, this example. Suppose at T1 you light a fuse. At T2 the fuse burns. At T3 you get an explosion. Surely the precedence of the lighting to the burning is no argument whatsoever that the burning is epiphenomenal. The burning is in the chain of causation. It is part of the causal process that starts with the lighting and ends with the exploding. So what's the evidence why the burning would be epiphenomenal, why the conscious willing would be unlike the burning, why would it be epiphenomenal? If you look at the experimental evidence, there's absolutely none. Um, the problem is it's very hard to verify for technical reasons. What you want is a case where you get the readiness potential at one second or a half second prior to voluntary motor movement, and then see whether you get a voluntary motor movement. The reason you can't do that is because the readiness potential itself to be isolated requires that you do an average of at least 40 trials. And the result is, because there's so much noise, to eliminate the noise, you need to back average. You need to have the motor movement in order to back average from it to find the readiness potential. You can't find the phenomenon without the action, which means you can't test what you want, which is, do you have a readiness potential and not bodily movement? However, there's anecdotal evidence. If you look at stop action experiments or veto experiments, people whose readiness potential is peaking for them to move their fingers, who then decide not to move their fingers, are successful in that task as long as they initiate that decision 50 milliseconds prior to the signal going out down to the motor plates on the muscle. Uh, you, got about a, you got about a 100 millisecond window to veto the process, and they can't. In which event, it's not conclusive, you might think. It's in the chain of causation, this conscious willing. It is not epiphenomenal, or at least there's no evidence to that effect. Now, why would someone like Daniel Wegner at Harvard, respected fellow, nice university, why would he say the opposite? Because he's got a picture of how this is supposed to look. He thinks the conscious will is a kind of ghost in the machine. He thinks it's sitting outside the chain of physical causation well, of course, if that's what it was, it really would be epiphenomenal. But now use the identification of conscious will with certain brain events, put it in the chain of causation, it's not epiphenomenal enough at all. It is part of what causes voluntary motor movements. No skepticism to be found there at all. Answer number one. Answer number two. It's plausible to identify the intention to move your finger earlier than the conscious awareness has a on an onset. Um, you might well think indeed the readiness potential in a supplementary motor area really measures the onset of intention, in which event the intention isn't just in the chain of causation, it's right there in the beginning of the pictured chain with the earlier onset readiness potential. If you look at the literature, about half the psychologists attaching um, live it take that view as well. Now, you might say, well, that's fine for intention. How about consciousness? But consciousness is a datable brain process, too. It takes real time. The question is, does it take that much time? Does it start back there at 550 milliseconds prior to muscle movement or not? That's an empirical question. Reaction time experiments put your reaction time to an external signal between about 1 and 200 milliseconds. But you know, you already formed your intention to move. Maybe it takes longer to form the intention. That's still an open issue. That's answer number two. The reason I want to glide over it is I want to finish with answer number three. Answer number three leaves philosophy of mind and brain science for moral philosophy. You know, we're not troubled with facts in moral philosophy the way you poor scientists are. So I can get better certitude, at least I can, on argument number three. Argument number three goes like this. Concede that conscious willing is epiphenomenal with the bodily movements it putatively but doesn't cause. Suppose that's true. 
can you still be said by your choices to control those bodily movements? Now here's the little handout that you might have gotten at the door. Um, it looks worse than it is, so bear with me as we go through it for a moment. Here's the general strategy. This is case number one on this list. Golf instructors often tell their pupils, to get a square hit on the ball, don't focus on the ball. Focus on getting a good follow through. Get a good follow through and you'll get a square hit. Now, the square hit occurs prior to the follow through because that advice, so that advice can't be based on the thought that the follow through causes the square hit. Causation doesn't work backwards in time. If you need a good book on that, there's one that came out recently that defends that view amongst others. Um, so causation doesn't work backwards, but here's how I take it the advice works. If you get a good follow through, that will only be because, on this chart at T1, you had a psychological set to get such a good follow through, and the psychological set will actually do two things. It will get you the good follow through, but at T2, it'll also get you a square hit on the ball. In which event, if you can control getting a good follow through at T3, you can control getting a square hit at T2. That's the essential strategy. Notice you would then have control of something that you do not cause. Now let's tech it up a bit. Let's do the, the brain science version. Number two, I couldn't resist doing Paul Revere, not Paul Revere and the Red Raiders, Paul Revere, the guy who did the one if by land, two if by sea. So suppose it went like this. 1775, during the American Revolution, they want to know whether the British are coming by land or by sea, one if by land, two if by sea, right? They need the light in the tower. The Patriot's in the tower of the Old North Church. He's ready to signal, but then he discovers his war wounds prevent him from moving. He's totally paralyzed. He can't move. He can't thus reach up and turn the signal on to give Revere his message. Luckily for him, however, Benjamin Libet is right next to him and is attached to his scalp, right at the vertex, a measurement, some electrodes, to measure whether he's got a readiness potential. And to help him out, he's put a little light on it to show that he's got the readiness potential. And then he's put a magnifier on the light, which will turn on the light in the Old North Church. So the paralyzed patriot says the following. If I intend to move my finger, I will its movement. I can't move my finger, I'm paralyzed. But by virtue of willing the movement of my finger on this chart at T3, I will cause 550 milliseconds to a full second earlier, the readiness potential in my supplementary motor area to go off, and by virtue of the Libetan device on my head, the little light will go off, and the little light will cause the North Church beacon to be lit, which will be received by Dawes and Revere, and they'll make their famous ride, causing the shot heard round the world. Here's my bet if the British caught this paralyzed patriot. Assuming they weren't so sympathetic, they would say about him, he alerted the rebels. That was his choice. He controlled whether they were alerted or not. He's fully morally responsible for alerting them, and he's fairly hung for treason if the British were in the war. Even though he didn't cause the light to go off, he controlled whether it went off by virtue of this epiphenomenal structure. Now let me finish with an even more complicated thought experiment. This one's one of my favorites. It was thought up by Bob Nozick, one of my neighbors when I was running a program at Harvard out in Belmont. He wrote it, it is said, to disprove rational choice theory, which is what his dissertation advisor was an adherent of. And here's how it worked. He said, imagine there is someone called the great predictor. He has a little science fiction. He says, this is 1971. Imagine the great predictor is a graduate student in psychology from another planet whose civilization is much more advanced than ours. He's really good at his job, in other words. We've seen him in 100 trials. He's never made a mistake. The great predictor offers you the following deal. He says there will be two boxes. I will put $1,000 in box number two for sure. It's guaranteed to be there. I will put a million dollars in box number one on the following condition. 
if I predict you will choose box number one only, rather than both boxes, I'll put a million dollars in it, and if indeed you choose either box number one or both boxes, you'll get whatever's in the boxes you choose. So you'll get box number one. If you choose box number one, you'll get a million bucks. If you choose both boxes, you'll get a million bucks plus a thousand dollars that's in box number two. That's what the great predictor is offering you as a deal. Now notice the payoff turns on something that you cannot cause. You cannot cause a million dollars to be put in box number one. The great predictor will put the million dollars in box number one only if he predicts you will decide only to take the first box and not both boxes. Now Scientific American did a survey in 1973 where they got hundreds of responses with regard to how people made this decision. And in the trade it's known everybody identifies themselves as a one boxer or a two boxer. Your choice set is not to take either box. Your choice set is either to take box number one, which is the box that does not have a thousand dollars in it but might have a million in it, or to take both boxes where you'll get whatever's in box number one and you'll get the thousand dollars that's for sure in box number two. Now rational choice theory would urge you to always take both boxes because that's the dominant strategy. No matter what the predictor predicts, your best strategy is to choose both boxes. Because if there's nothing in box one, well, you still get the thousand bucks in box two. If there is something in box one, you get the million bucks, but you also get a thousand bucks. Whatever the great predictor predicts, you really ought to, on rational choice theory, take box two. Now let's just tech it up a little bit. Suppose that the time spacing between T, between T1 and T4 is 10 seconds, and the great predictor is not a graduate student from another planet. His name is John Dylan Haynes, and he teaches at Berlin. Haynes goes from what he currently has, which is a 71% reliability rate on predicting what you're going to intend 10 seconds later, based on what he can read fMRI in your parietal cortex. Suppose he's up to 99 plus percent. In 100 trials, he's never been wrong. Namely, he reads your parietal co cortex, and if you're a two-boxer, he puts nothing in box number one. If you're a one-boxer, he puts a million bucks in. Never been wrong so far. What would you do? Would you choose the one box, or would you choose both boxes? Because notice the money's either in the box or not by the time you choose. If you look at this epiphenomenal, if you look at this ep if you look at your epiphenomenal um, chart, you'll notice the prediction is at T2. The money's put in the boxes or not at T3, and the decision is at T4. So you can't cause that money to be in that box. It's either there at the time you decide or not. I won't tell you the Scientific American survey. Let me ask you yourselves. How many people would pick both boxes? How many people would pick box number one only? <laughs> oh, really? Most mathematicians. Heidi and I ran a probability conference in Death Valley with mathematicians, economists, statisticians, philosophers, and the like. The mathematicians to a person went for two boxes. So it's good to see a mathematician stepping. <laughs> Now notice, most of you don't want to play. I was actually in a call on issue. I had some more time. But most of you don't want to play. But look, Scientific American, across all disciplines, found a 2.5 to 1 ratio of people who would pick just the first box, because they assume that's the only way they're really going to get a million bucks, as opposed to going with rational choice theory, which would be to pick both boxes. Suppose you think that's rational. Why would you think it's rational? You think it's rational because you can control what's in the box for you to get as a payoff, even though you cannot cause what's in the box. In which event, what you've got again is this epiphenomenal structure where your choice can only be made if your parietal cortex 10 seconds prior has done whatever it does to let John Dylan Hayes say what your intention is. And since he can see what it is and puts the money in based on what he sees, gee, I think I'd just go with the one box myself. 
in which event, notice you can be responsible for a choice even though you don't cause. So you can give libet to Haynes, that entire 35 years of psychologists, their epiphenomenal chart, and still maintain responsibility for your choices. You're responsible because you control the outcome even though you don't cause it, which I find to be an interesting result. Um, all right. If you take the skepticisms together, we have a much better science that makes them much more interesting. They were always here. You can find each of these skepticisms in Freud. You can find it in Skinner. You can find most of it in Hobbes. The challenge of a mechanistic determinism or an epiphenomenal branch of that has always been with us. What's new is the convincingness of the science, which in fact shows us these kinds of causal chains with a detail we didn't have before. If you go through each of the challenges, I think each of them can be diffused with the result that we can have our cake and eat it too. We can have the best science we've ever had of human behavior and human mentation, and we can maintain our responsibility for our choices that we've long believed in. That wouldn't be too shabby a result. Thank you for your time. I think I left a little bit of time for um, some questions before we go refresh ourselves. Derek. So are you going to have trouble if uh, the, the scientists someday show up with evidence that in some circumstances, uh, are, are you going to have trouble if uh, your brain scientists sometimes show up with evidence that sometimes the chain of events is not intention, consciousness, action, but intention, action, Consciousness. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of sure. LeBron James approaching the basket. Uh, <laughs> things happen fast. He may not, you know, he could do a flip and say, I didn't know I did it until after I did it. Yeah, no, the, that would make a, um, a case in which you would think consciousness couldn't be a cause. So it would take away the first two arguments, and that would be quite problematic. There are some people who want to claim that, but the data doesn't support it. In the case that is that consciousness succeeds the motion that it putatively causes rather than precedes it, um, it does depend a bit what you mean by conscious. If you allow yourself to get out of the Joycean sense, where it's the stream of consciousness phenomenology that you mean, if you make it a disposition, what Freud used to call preconscious, which is an ability to report, to direct attention if needed, then you can say what William James said, which is consciousness in the phenomenology sense is a scarce resource and it withdraws from skilled motor movements because it's not needed. You need it when you learn them and then it withdraws back up to more general plans. Um, you're still conscious in the sense that if you need to be, you can pay attention. Um, it actually may work, may make the shot worse if you do that, but nonetheless, you could pay attention. Uh, in which event, I would say that actually isn't a consciousness that succeeds in the pre-conscious sense of consciousness, in the dispositional sense that says you could, if you needed to, pay attention and you could report because you're paying attention in that sense, um, you were conscious. Um, I'm not a philosopher and I don't know anything about these things, but uh, the way it was explained to me once by a philosopher is that free will is a red herring and that all choices are made with limitations on our actions and certain knowledge sets and uh, certain uh, mental processing capacities and so forth. So how many of the people in prison deserve to be there? Uh, wouldn't it be, why do some countries like us have a lot more prison people in prison than other countries? Isn't this whole thing a lot more complicated than just responsibility? Isn't it about context and uh, and the whole, uh, the whole chain of, of uh, multiple uh, events that 
create a context for the choices. Well, your question is a lot more complicated than responsibility. I went to a philosophy talk once where the guy gave a long talk, and a question like yours was asked, and he pulled out an equally long talk, and he read it to us. But look, you're asking, you're asking things like, why are we the most imprisoned society in the history of Earth, which we are? One out of a hundred adults are in some form of incarceration. It's absolutely astonishing. Should most of them be there? Not for the reasons you think. They shouldn't be there because we've got criminal laws that criminalize things that shouldn't be criminalized, particularly the war on drugs. So we've got a lot of stuff that is putting people in prison, but that's just a different story. I do think a just... Yeah, but look, those are things that should, those are choices I would think shouldn't be criminalized, which is one of the reasons we have so many criminals. We've got so many drug offenders, but that's just a different issue. I think a just punishment system requires that people be responsible for the choices they make to which criminal sanctions are attached. That, I think, at a minimum, is required. And for that, we do need people to be actually responsible for their choices, otherwise it's unfair. Otherwise, we're simply incarcerating them on utilitarian grounds of prevention or deterrence rather than saying them in the eye. You deserve to be where you are. I want to be able to say to the prisoners, you deserve to be where you are. If you can't, I'll open the doors with you. Uh, Professor Moore, you rather left us hanging with that Virginia uh, convict. Uh, what happened with this case? Uh, was it overturned on appeal when it was found that he had a physical de defect, or was he still held to be responsible for his actions with regard to his stepdaughter? Suspense is killing you? Well, <laughs> it, because it, it, I actually wanted it as a thought experiment, not as a legal case to write down. What happened to the case was he actually was convicted, punished, and then they discovered the tumor. My question is, did we punish him unjustly? He didn't appeal, so there's no appellate. So the question is, before we discovered the tumor, he was punished retrospectively. If we knew prospectively what we knew retrospectively, do you think he deserved the punishment? Or is the fact that there is an identifiable cause of the urges on which he acted with his inappropriate sexual advances to his stepdaughter is he responsible for those despite the causation? That was the issue I wanted. Uh, he spent his time in jail. He was certified as safe once the tumor was removed, certified as safe again by the UVA doctors when it was removed a second time, because the urges were gone. Right. I... And here's, here's if, you, you know, if you wanted the conclusion again, it went like this. It was double-barreled. That he was caused by an identifiable cause is neither here nor there for responsibility. He's like the rest of us. He acted on his desires. If, however, there's truly an incapacitation of his ability to restrain himself, which there could well be given that tumor's location, then he has an excuse, i.e. he may not have full responsibility, he has diminished capacity. But that depends on the medical evidence. Yeah. Hmm. Right. A musician is suffering from visual agnosia. So in visual agnosia, which is a brain, a neurological condition, you actually lose uh, the visual field. You don't recognize things. You lose, you, your brain does not process the information. So he, uh, at the end, he, w he would see Oliver Sacks, his famous neurologist, which you have all probably heard of, and his book in his office, and at the end, he actually did mistake his wife for his hat. He was looking for his hat, and he saw his wife's head. And so it's exactly this case. As a mathematician, it, it's isomorphic to the first case. <laughs> totally. Oh, absolutely, sir. Absolutely, it's totally isomorphic. Totally the same. Totally the same case. And uh, of course, fortunately, this man was a musician, and Sachs gave him good advice. He says, "Concentrate on your music." Which you don't have to have, to, which the, the, his, his music capacity was not a, not in the slightest diminished, of course, because the the neurological condition was affecting only his visual field, and obviously the man in the Virginia is not guilty. The law read, the the actual verdict in the trial is guilty or not guilty. That's the same. This, guilty or not guilty is not the same as innocent, and of course, since his capacity was definitely diminished, 
in retrospect, he was not guilty at the time. Thank you. Well, I agree with you. His, if his capacity was diminished, I think that's right. I, I think the medical evidence is less conclusive. It was clearly diminished in the way that right hemisphere orbital frontal tumors diminish. Namely, you had a constructural, whatever that thing is, a faxia you doctors talk about and so forth. Namely, he couldn't, in fact, do designs and drawings. He had diminished capacities of that sort. There are studies of whether your veto capacities are truly inhibited. I didn't see the evidence in that particular case. Might be true, might not be true. I think that the fact that we have an identifiable cause, however, does not mean he's not responsible for having acted on his desires. If you want a famous case to compare it with, compare it to Patty Hearst. Patty Hearst was a Hearst heiress who, in fact, had no desires for revolution when she was a freshman at Berkeley, when abducted and put into the closet of a bunch of clowns calling themselves the Symbionese Liberation Army, and emerged 21 days later, coercively indoctrinated, to desire the army be financially successful so they could foment revolution. Did she have responsibility for acting on those desires when she held an AK-47 in the Bank of America in San Francisco? Went to the jury, you might think the answer would be yes if you think it's only a cause of her desires, but she could have done better if she had tried in acting on those desires. Or is she someone who's like a hypnotized patient? They're in a kind of fugue state so that she gestalt switched from the Patty Hearst to this new personality, and lo and behold, actually, some weeks later after the release, she went back to being Patty Hearst. In which event, you might say, well, she's like a hypnotized patient. She really wasn't there in the sense of having a unified consciousness to be responsible. That's a kind of incapacitation, too. But notice you don't let the patient off with the tumor or Patty Hearst just because there's a cause for what they desire that they didn't control. Yeah, go ahead. You're a mathematician, right? Absolutely. I understand the concept of proof, sir. That's what mathematicians do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But this isn't your kind of proof. This is a... <laughs> See, not only are you a mathematician, but you're a one-boxer to boot. So you're a rare bird. I thought you were on my side that went something like this. Mathematicians and philosophers care about getting it right. How you prove whether the facts that make it right really exist, well, that's for the fact grubbers. That's for the scientist types, right? We are. Well, much a philosopher is a lawyer. The Buddhists say there is no I. There's no such thing as an I. There's no such thing as? I, like me. I, yeah. The disappearing self. Yet the Buddhists take great responsibility in their compassion for other beings and even try not to kill gnats. So I guess my question would be, why do we focus so much on the locus of responsibility as being something that is uh, responsible for actions, couldn't we say there is no I and still be responsible for behavior? Uh, look, I think morality is really interesting in this regard. It's asymmetrical between those who can hold rights and duties and those to whom such duties are owed. You might easily think you have to have the capacities of rationality, autonomy, and the other items I mentioned to be held responsible, that is to have obligations and be responsible for their breach, that does not commit you to thinking you don't have obligations to 
beings who themselves are incapable of having them. You could have duties to fetuses, animals, or on some environmentalists' view, lakes and rivers, without for a moment animizing them as being moral agents. I once taught a course with an environmentalist called Unorthodox Ethical Entities, UEE. Um, you could have duties to all kinds of things, which themselves have no duties to you. Morality, I think, is interestingly asymmetrical. So I could have a view, like Schweitzer's, that all life is sacred, and therefore I have a duty to protect all of it without for a minute thinking the amoeba have duties to me. There were people who thought that some lower forms of life had duties. You know, the French in the Middle Ages tried rats. They tried them because they were really responsible for spreading diseases. And on one of the famous rat trials, the accused didn't show up, and the question was whether you could get a default judgment, and his attorney said, but he didn't show up because someone would try to catch him. He was under duress. <laughs> well, the Swiss used to hang dogs in the 11th century, and the English went even better. They used to chop up the tree as deodand if it fell on you. So they thought there were tree spirits. Get rid of those anthropomorphic, sort of semi-Freudian ways of looking at the world, and you won't, in fact, think any of those people have obligations, even if you have obligations to them. Let's do one more. Um, thank you. So you, uh, in one of your examples, you described uh, the, um, the rational, responsible agency as a capacity. Uh, to overcome a series of events that your brain had set in motion. Um, that is a very, um, you know, that is your, your uh, identity working with veto power to overcome something that's already set in motion. Um, yeah, that's not the main arrow in my quiver, but I did say that. Okay. Um, does that arrow have a uh, positive description as well of, um, of the moral agent that does something other than veto a chain of events that has already started? Does it have some um, some picture where it's actually initially responsible for a chain of events? Which is the it? Are we looking at specifically the veto function? Yeah, if we're looking... Look, I think the locus of your responsibility is double-barreled. You're responsible for the choice that on the first two of my three arguments causes the bodily movements that are its object. You're the initiating trigger, and later on, you are the omitter of someone who could stop it who didn't. So you have the responsibility both for causing and for failing to prevent the particular bodily movement that leads to a harm. You have both of those, even though both functions are unconscious processes that begin before you are aware, either that you've triggered or that you have the opportunity to veto, either one. So I think you've got two loci of responsibility. I don't know about you, I could use a drink. Shall we take a break? <laughs>